हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा A day after Iran fired some 300 missiles and drones on Israel, the world is urging restraint. Israel's war cabinet is talking retaliation. The question is, can Netanyahu do it alone? If his western allies do not support him, can he still attack Iran? Does he have the military and financial capability to deal with the consequences? Also, why did Arab states help defend Israel against Iran? and how militarized is this region which countries have military assets in west asia troops warships and bases and how many of them tonight we'll tell you about all of it and why this is a potentially explosive zone also discussing the war that the world has forgotten about one year of the sudan war with the highest number of people displaced but who cares in india the ruling bjp has released its election promises what stands out and what is the response In Singapore the end of an era Prime Minister Lee is stepping down next month in the UK people have taken the MI5 to court over intelligence failure can you do that in your country why african runners help the chinese competitor win a marathon why the global times is targeting tesla for its india plans and what is sad leave do you need it all this and more coming up the headlines first Another stabbing incident in Sydney, the second one in 3 days. The latest attack took place during a church service in the western part of the city. At least 4 people were injured. The suspect has been arrested. On Saturday a knife rampage at a shopping mall killed 6 people. The Philippines rules out giving the US access to more military bases. The decision comes days after a trilateral summit between the US, Japan and the Philippines. Currently the US military has access to 9 bases in the Philippines. Washington wants to strengthen its alliance with Manila to counter China. In India no relief for jail Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal the Supreme Court refuses an early hearing in the case the next hearing will be on the 29th of April which means Chief Minister Kejriwal will remain in jail when the general election begins he was arrested by the enforcement directorate on the 21st of March Azerbaijan and Armenia face off at the top court of the United Nations Baku accuses Yerevan of waging a media campaign against it The legal clash comes amid heightened tensions between the neighbors over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. Donald Trump's hush money trial begins in New York. He is the first former American president ever to be criminally prosecuted. Trump is accused of falsifying business records to cover cover up an alleged sexual encounter. This comes just months ahead of the presidential election. Trump is the presumptive Republican nominee. And Samsung beats Apple to become the world's biggest smartphone brand. In the first quarter of 2024, iPhone sales dropped drastically. It was Apple's biggest drop in sales since COVID-19 lockdowns. Last year, Apple had overtaken Samsung to emerge on top. Nervous and worried. That's West Asia right now. It's been almost 48 hours since Iran attacked Israel, but so far Israel has not responded, mostly thanks to global pressure. We've seen different statements from different camps. The West has criticized Iran, China and Russia have criticized Israel, and the Arab states did not criticize anyone, but all these statements had one thing in common. They all urged restraint. and we saw more of that at the united nations israel had called for a security council meeting they tried to rally opinion against They're iran but most unsc members had the same message to give no. you must deescalate our goal is to deescalate and then get back to the issue at hand securing an end to the conflict in gaza by getting a ceasefire in gaza through a hostage deal В этой связи отмечаем сигнал. We urge the West in Jerusalem to follow suit and reject the practice of provocative views of force in the Middle East, as they are fraught with extremely dangerous risks, risks and consequences for the whole region. Yinan 方面表示, 
China calls on the parties concerned to show maximum calm and restraint and resolve their differences and disputes in accordance with the purposes of the UN Charter. So the red lines are clear. No one wants Israel to retaliate, not its allies in the West, not the Arab states, and not Russia, China, or India. If they want to do it, they must do it alone. Which raises the most important question. Is Israel capable of such an operation? Can they ignore global sentiment and attack alone? Iran is hoping it won't come to that. Their ambassador said so at the United Nations Security Council. He said the operation was designed to limit the scope for escalation. But Israel is not buying it. Their ambassador said Iran crossed a red line, so they have the right to retaliate. You are wrong. This attack crossed every red line, and Israel reserves the legal right to retaliate. We are not a frog in boiling water. We are a nation of lions. It was precise and only targeted military objectives and carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation and prevent civilian harm. But again, can Israel do it alone? They have carried out operations inside Iran, like cyber attacks to cripple their nuclear program and assassinations of Iranian scientists. But those attacks were different, A, because the West supported them, and B, because it was a shadow war. So Israel could turn around and say, not us. But an open military attack is a different ballgame altogether. It's a scenario Israel has often prepared for. In June last year, for example, they carried out a two-week military drill. The focus was on Iran on how to fight a multi-front war against them. So Israel does have the planning and the resources. But are they ready for what could come next? Like a full-blown war with Iran, are they ready for that? Usually such solo operations require four things or four conditions. Number one, your economy must be able to take the hit. But Israel's economy is struggling. Their GDP shrank in the last three months of 2023, that is last year, the last three months of last year. It shrank. By how much? Almost 5%. Their exports have also been affected. In 2023, Israeli exports were worth $156 billion, which is 6% down compared to 2022. So can Israel bankroll a long multi-front war? With US support? Yes, they can. But without it? Maybe not. The second condition is political support. Do you have the backing of a coalition? Do you have allies on your side? Again, in this case, the answer is no. The US and the UK have refused to support a counter-strike. They have lots of assets in West Asia. But if war breaks out, these assets could become targets. So military aid may continue, but direct support is not 100% certain. Now we come to condition number three. Military superiority. Iran has more soldiers, warships and natural resources. Yes, Israel's army is more advanced, but Iran fights unconventionally. You can expect their proxies to open multiple fronts. So the point is, victory is not certain. And finally, condition number four, domestic support. And that's not a problem for Iran. Saturday's attack has rallied the public there. We've seen celebrations and fireworks in Tehran, so Iranians are ready for it. Look at this message posted by the Ayatollah. It's a video of Iranian drones over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And look at the caption, Jerusalem will soon be in Muslim hands. So fighting Israel is a popular policy in Iran. And even if it wasn't, people can't do very much there because Iran's supreme leader has an iron grip over the country. But Israel's situation is different. Prime Minister Netanyahu is already unpopular. Most Israelis think that he is mishandling the war in Gaza. So will they trust him to lead another war? It's among the many questions facing Netanyahu. Of course, Israel can just ignore all of this, like the Americans did in Iraq or like the Russians are doing in Ukraine. But remember, Israel is not Russia or the US. They may not be able to sustain a war without support. And don't forget the tactical issues. Iran and Israel are separated by other countries like Syria, Iraq and Jordan. So how would Israeli missiles even reach Iran? There are Russian assets in Syria, Iranian proxies in Iraq, and Jordan is not exactly happy with Israel's war in Gaza, so any of them could shoot down Israel's missiles. Some experts think the sea could be an option. Israel has around five submarines. They can fire cruise missiles from the Indian Ocean. 
It does eliminate the issue of airspace, but still one problem remains. Iran's navy is far superior to Israel. So my point here is quite simple. There are no easy options. Israel could use jets and missiles to target Iranian sites. They're also capable of doing it all alone. But they may not be ready for what happens next. A multi-front war, global isolation, and pushback from allies. So right now, things could go either way, and this has West Asia on edge. Remember, we're talking about one of the most militarized regions in the world, not just because of what the regional players have, but also because what global powers have deployed. There's a large number of troops and military assets, from guns to long-range missiles, warships, and combat aircraft, and these are all active assets. For example, when Iran fired drones and missiles, three Western nations swung into action to defend Israel. The United States, the United Kingdom, and France. These are all permanent members of the United Nations Security Council and all with significant forces in the region. Of course, the U.S. has the biggest presence. Before the current tensions exploded, American forces were present in at least 10 West Asian countries. The U.S. was present in 10 countries at least. Out of these, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and the UAE host the biggest American military bases and the largest contingent of U.S. troops. According to some estimates, the U.S. has more than 45,000 troops and more than 20 bases in the region. The exact numbers have not been disclosed. America never does that. But even by the most conservative estimates, the U.S. presence is quite significant. Which brings us to the U.K. They have around 2,500 troops and 23 military bases in the region. The Brits are present in countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq and Jordan. What about France? France has been a key player in the region for many decades. As of 2022, there were about 2,000 French soldiers in the region. Now, if you add all of this, you get some 50,000 soldiers. The US, the UK and France alone have at least 50,000 troops in West Asia. And they sent even more when Iran threatened to attack Israel. Those additional deployments are yet to be recalled, and the U.S. has confirmed this. The pre-positioned forces, uh, even in the last few days, uh, destroyers and fighter squadrons uh, into the region to help Israel defend itself, to keep it from uh, becoming a wider war, to keep it from escalating further. It's not clear when the West will withdraw these troops, and they may say that this is for deterrence, but it's a double-edged sword, really. A provocation can lead to a major clash, given all the presence here, because their rivals, too, have military presence in the region. The biggest among them is, of course, Russia. Russia has around 6,000 troops in Syria. The Russian military is also said to be active in Libya. And this is what makes it a tinderbox, this concentration of firepower in one region. It's staggering. Plus, you have the regional players like Israel, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iran, Iraq. And these deployments are not limited to land. The high seas are also being militarized, especially in the wake of the Gaza war. Every significant geopolitical player has a warship in the region now. The United States has 19 warships, seven in the eastern Mediterranean and another 12 spread out across three areas, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea. The Red Sea in particular is crowded. Last year, when the Houthis began attacking ships, navies from around the world rushed to the region. This includes Russia, China, European nations like Germany, France, Italy, the United Kingdom, Greece and Belgium, and even Asian players like India and Sri Lanka. Until a few weeks back, India had some 10 warships deployed here. Now, all these countries are trying to protect their consignments from attacks especially the oil supplies from West Asia. That's what they're trying to protect. So there's a substantial naval presence here and a lot of volatility with at least 45 armed conflicts on as we speak. This is what makes West Asia a potentially explosive region. The last thing they want is a war between Israel and Iran. As they say, fighting fire with fire will only leave you with ashes. We told you about the U.S. bases. Now let's talk about the countries hosting them, the Arab nations of West Asia. When Iran launched its attack, one thing struck most observers. Jordan shot down the Iranian drones and missiles. Jordan, a Muslim Arab nation, took up arms to defend Israel. A country with a queen of Palestinian heritage defended Israel. 
Can you imagine the domestic headache this causes? It's why Jordan is pretending it did not help very much. Yesterday, we dealt with some flying objects that entered our airspace and were confronted to prevent them from endangering the safety of our citizens and populated residential areas. The debris fell in multiple areas during that time without causing any damage or injuries among citizens. Jordan is doing its best to show that it was just protecting itself, not Israel. We'll soon see if their people buy this explanation, but Jordan is not the only Arab state that helped Israel. It's the only one that did it so publicly. A lot of others helped in secret. Reports say that Saudi Arabia and the UAE were also involved. They shared intelligence about the Iranian attack. And that's not all. Arab nations also opened their airspace, allowing Israel's British and American allies to defend it. The Arabs host Western air defense systems, surveillance and refueling aircraft as well. All of this would have been used in the defense of Israel. So most Arab nations did help protect Israel from Iran. But we should mention something else here. This was not some betrayal of the Iranians or the greater Muslim cause for that matter. It's nothing like that. Iran wanted the Arab countries to pass along this information to the US. Tehran likely wanted the attack to fail. As we mentioned yesterday, the attack was to save face, to put up a good show for the domestic audience. Iran doesn't want an all-out war with Israel. If it did, it would have attacked long ago. Iran had to react to the destruction of its embassy in Syria. They also had to make sure that they did not actually hurt Israel too much. And how do you ensure that? Telegraph your attack via Arab back channels. The plan seems to have worked. Iran can say it attacked. Israel did not really suffer any serious damage. The US can say they protected their ally. And the Arab countries, minus Jordan, can pretend that they're not involved. Everyone wins. Well, except the Iranian, Israeli, and American taxpayers. They paid for the fireworks show after all. But then taxpayers always lose. Everyone else walks away with a victory. But how did it come to this? How are the Arab nations suddenly helping the Israelis, who until a few years ago were the ultimate enemy? It boils down to self-interest. Most of the Arab states are rich. Take Saudi Arabia and the UAE, for example. They make billions through oil. They already have giant buildings and sports cars on every other street. These countries want to spend their wealth on development or prepare for an oil-free future, like Saudi Arabia, which is building futuristic cities and buying entire sports. These rich Arab states do not want to be slowed down, especially because of a war between two of their former enemies. If a war breaks out, everything goes up in smoke. Arab airspace will be compromised regularly. Misfired weapons will damage their infrastructure. Their air bases will constantly be used by the US, making them targets. It will be almost impossible for the Arab nations to avoid getting sucked into this conflict, so they would rather just avoid the war altogether and focus on improving their nations. They've been trying to do this for years now. Take the UAE and Bahrain. These two countries recognized Israel back in 2020 after the US-led Abraham Accords. It took years of diplomacy to bring this about, to de-escalate the situation between Israel and the Arab nations. Saudi Arabia was widely expected to follow suit, but hopes for that were dashed last October with the Hamas attack and the following Israel-Hamas war. Now, an Israel-Iran war will be much worse. It will derail all the plans the rich Arab nations have laid out, which is why these countries will try and prevent a war at any cost. Now, we turn our attention to the Sudan, the country the other country at war in the greater Arab region. The Sudan civil war hit the one year mark today. It's been one year of carnage there. You have Sudan's army on one side and a paramilitary group, the Rapid Support Forces or RSF on the other side. So it's a military junta versus warlord situation. And as you can imagine, civilians are bearing the brunt of this. Eight and a half million Sudanese people have been displaced. It's the worst displacement crisis in the world right now. About 18 million people in the Sudan are facing food insecurity. 14 million children need humanitarian assistance, but it seems the world has forgotten them. Only waking up briefly on anniversaries like today before going back to ignoring the crisis. Here's our report.
الدول العالم كلها مشغولة بالعالم All the countries of the world are busy with the rest of the world, but we are third world countries. No one is concerned about us. That is why we all suffered, honestly speaking. That is the simple, grim assessment of the war in Sudan by a resident of Omdurman, the second most populous city in Sudan, a sister city to the capital Khartoum. Both Khartoum and Omdurman mostly lie in ruins now the result of one year of civil war. It started on the 15th of April 2023, when a paramilitary group called the Rapid Support Forces attacked the government's military bases. Sudan was already under the rule of a military junta, led by this man, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan. He styles himself as the chairman of Sudan's Transnational Sovereignty Council. Sounds much nicer than calling oneself a junta chief. Al-Burhan took control after a coup in late 2021. He was joined by this man, Mohammad Hamdan Dagalo, who also goes by the name Hemeti. Hemeti is the deputy chairman of Sudan's transitional council, basically Al-Burhan's second in command. But last April, Hemeti tried to overthrow Al-Burhan. That's why the RSF, which reports to Hemeti, attacked Sudan's military bases. This power struggle between Al-Burhan and Hemeti has killed thousands and displaced millions. The death toll has crossed 15,000. About 33,000 people are injured. 8.6 million have been displaced. About 1.8 million people have fled to neighboring countries, mostly Chad, Egypt and South Sudan. The remaining 6.8 million are internally displaced, living on the streets or in refugee camps. 8.6 million displaced people. That's almost the entire population of Switzerland, more than double the population of Croatia. Sudan is facing the biggest displacement crisis in the world. More than a third of the country faces acute food insecurity. About 18 million people, almost 5 million of them are on the brink of famine. But almost no one has cared to try and save them. Before today, aid agencies had asked for $2.7 billion to try and help the people of Sudan. $2.7 billion from all international donors. How much did they end up getting? 6% of that. That's close to $160 million about $10 for each person urgently in need of aid. But today, the world finally woke up on the one-year anniversary of the war. Germany will therefore provide a further 244 million euros in humanitarian aid to help the people of Sudan. Germany isn't the only one. The entire EU is chipping in. The European Commission will announce its contribution for the year 2024 in the amount of almost 355 million euros in order to reaffirm our support for the Sudanese. The US is putting in some money too. It is pledging $100 million. Together, these pledges come close to $750 million, still $2 billion shy of what the aid agencies have asked for, but much better than before. It's a shame, though, that we had to wait for an anniversary for the world to remember that the people of Sudan are suffering. Let's turn to India now, where we are just days away from the general election. The first phase of voting is this week on Friday. So the race is on to woo voters. The ruling BJP is widely expected to win this election, so all the focus is on their strategy. What will Prime Minister Modi do if he wins another term? Well, the party has released its manifesto. It's called Modi's Guarantee. The document is almost 70 pages long. It focuses on jobs, digital infrastructure and social welfare. We'll come to the big highlights, but first, what are the reactions like? America Citibank is a bit disappointed. They say the manifesto lacks big bank reforms. And what did they have in mind? Things like reforming land acquisition laws, tweaking labor rules, privatizing key industries, and relaxing limits on foreign investments.
Now, these are all very sensitive issues. They often trigger criticism among voters, so it's not surprising that the BJP has not mentioned them in the manifesto. But does it mean that these reforms will not happen? Well, manifestos are not legally binding. They simply offer a broad overview. Parties end up doing things that are not in the manifesto. They also end up doing not doing things that are in the manifesto. And City realizes this. They say the reforms could be announced down the line, which brings us to the big promises. We've shortlisted 10 big promises. Let's cover the social welfare promises first. Number one, one is free food grains for the poor. This scheme is already in place, but the BJP says we will extend it for another five years. It will benefit around 800 million Indians. Number two, expanding the Ayushman Bharat scheme. And what does it offer? Free health care up to 5 lakh rupees for poor families, which is around $6,000, plus free health coverage for senior citizens. And these are Indians aged 60 and above. Number three, free electricity for poor families. Number four, increasing the minimum support price for crops. We've explained the MSP before. It's like a floor price for crops, the price at which governments buy from farmers. Many farmers want to legalize this MSP, but the BJP has not promised that. They're promising to increase it from time to time. And it will be a key issue in agricultural states. Now we come to the structural promises. That is number five, implementing the Citizenship Amendment Act. Again, we've explained this before on the show. The CAA, Citizenship Amendment Act, fast tracks citizenship for religious minorities in the region, like Buddhists in Afghanistan or Hindus in Pakistan. But it does not apply to persecuted Muslims. The law has already been notified by the government. The BJP says it will be implemented in the next term. Promise number six, the Uniform Civil Code. India has personal laws for different religions. They cover issues like divorce and inheritance. So these laws often vary. It's a different set of laws for Muslims, a different set for Hindus, a different set for Sikhs, and so on. The BJP has long promised to end this system. They want a uniform personal law, one that mixes the best traditions with modern times. That's what the BJP says. Promise number seven, one nation, one election. Basically, the national and state elections will be held together. Right now, it's not the case. We are holding the general or national elections right now. State elections have a different cycle. State governments, in fact, have a different election cycle. So the BJP says, we'll end that. We will hold all the elections together. Again, it's a long-standing promise of theirs, but expect the opposition to push back, especially regional political parties. Promise number eight, to make India the third largest economy. It's the fifth largest right now. You have Germany, Japan, China, and the US above India, where the BJP is promising to move up the list to overtake both Japan and Germany. And how close is the gap? India's GDP is around $3.7 trillion. Germany is $4 trillion. Japan is 4.2. Experts say India will overtake both these countries by 2030, so the end of this decade. Now we come to the final two promises. Number, number nine is to make India a Vishwa Bandhu, meaning a relative or kin of the world. This promise covers a lot of initiatives, like leading the Global South, becoming a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, pushing the neighborhood first policy, establishing an economic corridor via Israel to Europe, and cooperating in the Indo Pacific. Nothing stands out here. It's a continuation of the Modi government's foreign policy. Which brings us to the final promise to create a Surakshit Bharat or a secure India. Again, a lot of initiatives are part of this, like zero tolerance to terrorism, creation of the theater commands in the military, building better infrastructure along the China, Pakistan and Myanmar borders, and protecting India's interests in the Indian Ocean. So that's the top 10 highlights. A couple of things are missing from this document. For starters, there is no mention of Jammu and Kashmir's statehood. The government has said that statehood will be restored, but the manifesto does not talk about it. Another one is the NRC, the National Register for Citizens. It was often clubbed with the CAA to criticize the government. Critics said it would strip Indian Muslims off their citizenship. So even the NRC is gone, from the manifesto at least. We've also noticed a new trend in the BJP manifesto. It mostly refers to India as Bharat. The word India appears 43 times. The word Bharat appears 199 times, so that's a major symbolic change. But on policy, the BJP has focused on continuity. You won't find radically new programs or ideas in the document. I guess the premium is on doing more of the same. 
Our next story is from Singapore, where a momentous change has been set in motion. Singapore will soon see a new prime minister. The date has been announced, that is May 15th. So exactly a month from now, the change of guard is imminent. That is when the island nation will get its fourth prime minister. Here is a rel the relatively short and to the point message. Prime Minister Lee Sin Loong will step down on May 15th. Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong will succeed him. The new Prime Minister will be sworn in at 8 p.m. on May 15th. It's a rather abrupt way to announce the end of an era because Prime Minister Lee will be stepping down after almost 20 years in charge. He's only Singapore's third Prime Minister after it gained self-governance. That was in 1959. That's even before Singapore was an independent country. But since 1959, Singapore has had only three prime ministers, all from the same party, the People's Action Party, or PAP. In fact, two of Singapore's prime ministers were from the same family. Lee is the second prime minister in his line. His father was the first, Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of modern Singapore. The senior Lee was the longest serving leader of the country. He was in office for over 31 years, from 1959 to 1990. His son, current Prime Minister Lee Sin Loong, is leaving office after almost 20 years. Between them, they have ruled Singapore for more than 51 years. So for the younger Lee to step down marks a radical shift, a new age in Singapore. The Lee family is synonymous with Singapore's growth story. The father, Lee Kuan Yew made Singapore what it is. He brought Singapore out of a greater Malaysia back when the region became independent. Lee championed economic growth. He had zero tolerance for corruption and he instilled these values across his party. He was also authoritarian though, effectively making Singapore a one party ruled nation. But perhaps because of his skill or Singapore's size, it worked. Singapore grew from a tiny backwater island into a financial powerhouse it was a lot to live up to. The son, Lee Sin Loong, had a lot to prove. Now he's led Singapore for almost two decades and the country is still a beacon of development in Asia. So Lee Jr. stepping down will set a new phase in motion. It also brings with it pressure for his successor. That's Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong. Wong was chosen as the leader of the PAP's fourth generation lineup in 2022 also called the 4G team, meaning he'd been chosen to become Singapore's fourth prime minister. Singapore's government has been planning for a smooth transition ever since. And now the date has been set. Prime Minister Lee has put up this Facebook post after the announcement. He's asked the citizens of Singapore to give Wong their full support. Wong also took to social media and he put up this video. My fellow Singaporeans, when I was invited to enter politics in 2011, I agreed because I wanted to contribute to the Singapore story. I did not expect then to be asked to serve as the next Prime Minister of Singapore. I accept this responsibility with humility and a deep sense of duty. I pledge to give my all in this undertaking. Every ounce of my energy shall be devoted to the service of our country and our people. Your dreams will inspire my actions. Your concerns will guide my decisions. I ask each of you to join me in this journey. Wong will become Prime Minister on May 15th. Only the fourth Prime Minister in Singapore's history. He will have big shoes to fill and he will also have to consolidate his own power. Singapore must hold elections by November 2025, but reports say it may call for early polls so that Wong wins his own mandate. Whatever happens, we wish Singapore the best for the days ahead. In 2017, the UK witnessed one of its worst terror attacks in history. 22 people died in a bombing. Another 100 were injured. An inquiry was held. It found that the attack could have been avoided had MI5 acted on the intelligence it received. MI5 is a British intelligence agency. It had information about the bomber. It knew that there was a national security threat, but did not act on it quickly enough. Now, survivors and families of victims are taking MI5 to court. More than 250 people are taking legal action. This is believed to be the first time MI5 has been sued over its failure to stop a domestic terror attack. 
Have there been cases, other cases like this in the world? And is this the way to go about it? Can you sue the intelligence agency of your country? Here's a report. In a rare turn of events, more than 250 people have joined a group action. They have sued the MI5, the British Intelligence and Security Agency. Why? To answer this question, we need to go back to 2017. In May that year, the UK witnessed one of its worst terror attacks in history. It happened at a concert of pop star Ariana Grande in Manchester. Just as concert goers were leaving the show, a suicide bomber detonated his device. 22 people were killed, another 100 were injured. And when we left, there was, um, like, down the stairs, there was, like, there was, like, kids, well, probably, like, early teenagers all laid on the floor. They were, like, covered in blood and like, blood on the walls where they'd been laid. So it was just horrifying, really. It was, like, absolute terror. It was, yeah, trauma. There was a split was moment where we said to each other, we thought, well, like, we're going to die. Yeah. Because you're just running for your life. The bombing shook Britain and the world alike. An official inquiry was held. It concluded in March 2023. It said that the attack was avoidable. It could have been averted had the MI5 acted on vital intelligence. So the bombing was the result of an intelligence failure. Here's how. The atrocity was carried out by a 22-year-old named Salman Abedi. He was from Manchester but of Libyan descent. Abedi was a subject of interest to MI5 in 2014, but his case was closed because he was deemed to be low risk. Abedi returned from Libya four days before the blast. MI5 had this piece of information, but according to the inquiry, they didn't take it too seriously. Abedi used a homemade bomb to target the crowds. He stored it in a car in Manchester. Had the MI5 begun an investigation, they could have found the bomb. So there were missed opportunities here, and that had devastating consequences. Following the inquiry last year, the Security Services Director General Ken McCallum issued a public apology. McCallum said, I am profoundly sorry that MI5 did not prevent the attack. But this did little to quell public anger. So about a year later, hundreds of bombing survivors along with relatives of the victims are taking the MI5 to court. This is believed to be the first time MI5 has been sued over its failure to stop a domestic terror attack. In fact, this is a rare case for the world. Intelligence agencies have been sued the world over, sometimes over allegations of spying, other times for defamation, but hardly ever for an intelligence failure. The Manchester bombing survivors and the families of the victims, though, say that their decision is justified. They argue that the MI5 is well-funded and well-equipped. They had information about Salman Abedi and they chose to ignore it and failed at their sole job. It cost people their lives. So now it's time that the MI5 pays the price. Our next story is all kinds of bizarre. It's funny, it's confusing, but it's also cheating. On Sunday, China hosted the Beijing Half Marathon. Some 20,000 runners took part. They had to cover 21 kilometers. Up ahead, Four runners were stuck together, one from China, two from Kenya, and one from Ethiopia. The African runners were slightly ahead, but in the final stretch, something strange happened. The African runners asked the Chinese runner to overtake them. You can see them wave him through. Take a look. Mm. <笑>我们看四个人很有默契啊 how embarrassing is that? The event, eventual winner was He Ji. He finished one second ahead of the African runners, but clearly it was all rigged. 
You see, He Zhe is quite the star in China. He's 25 years old. He won the marathon gold at the Asian Games. He also holds the national record, so making him win was a priority for the organizers. One of the runners from Kenya has spoken out about this. He admits letting He Zhe win. But guess why? Because he was his friend. As far as excuses go, not a good one. The cameras clearly picked up what happened here. And once it went on social media, there was outrage. People called it embarrassing and unfair. So the organizers had to do something. They've launched an investigation into what happened. But don't expect anything significant because this is routine in China. Marathons are quite the craze there now. In 2023, around 170 Chinese cities hosted marathons, 170 Chinese cities. Some, like Beijing, hosted more than 10 races, and the participation was quite high. The Shanghai Marathon, for instance, has 170,000 pre-registrations. It tells you how popular these races are. But not all of them are fair. Like this one in Beijing, it was sponsored by a Chinese sports company called X-Step. And guess which runner they also sponsor? He Zhe, the same runner who got the free overtake. So try joining the dots now. Chances are the sponsors wanted their man to win. But why did the African runners play along? A Chinese sports expert has a possible explanation. Maybe the prize money was guaranteed or maybe a bonus was promised if they let the Chinese runner win. Either way, it's not done. And this whole controversy exposes two problems. One, the state of China's marathons. It's pretty bad. In 2018, 258 runners cheated in the Shenzhen race. Many of them took shortcuts. Another incident was in 2019. Instead of running, a woman decided to ride her bike. She was caught on camera and asked to dismount. So clearly, China needs more oversight. And that's problem number one. Problem number two is the frequency of such incidents. They signal an attitude problem, a desire to win by bending rules. We've seen that at the highest levels in China. At the 2012 Olympics, eight badminton players were disqualified. Two of them were Chinese. They threw a match in the group stages. The idea was to get an easier opponent in the knockouts. Another example is Sun Yang. He was a world and Olympic champion in swimming, but he was later banned by authorities. Do you know why? Because in 2018, he destroyed vials with his blood samples. It's not something that innocent people do. In 2019, there was another example. China was hosting the World Military Games. One of the events was orienteering. It's like a mix between sprinting and treasure hunting. You must follow clues and maps to reach checkpoints. Just one problem. The Chinese onlookers helped their runners. They planted clues across the route. So eventually other countries complained about it. Last year at the Asian Games, similar complaints were raised. Some Indian athletes were unhappy with the officiating. They lodged a complaint with the organizers. So clearly there's a trend. It's easy to blame it on the athletes, to call them dishonest. But it's also a sim symptom of the wider problem here. Athletes who win are celebrated in China, but athletes who lose are ridiculed, trolled and worse. Now we're not saying it's an excuse to cheat, but I'm sure it doesn't help. Chinese organizers and authorities need to realize the most important thing about sport. Winning is not important. Winning the right way is. Well, that's China for you. Trying to win at any cost. So cheating is perhaps par for the course. But what happens when China falls behind? When someone else tries to pull ahead? They can be unpleasant, even racist. Let me show you how. China has launched into a tirade against India, and it's not their first one. In the past, they've called Indian men clowns. More recently, they've mocked the, Indian, the iPhones made in India. They say those phones smell of curry. The latest attack comes from the Global Times. It is in the form of a video. Now, Global Times does not like the fact that Tesla wants to enter the Indian market. Some context here. India is trying to attract global EV makers. Last month, New Delhi announced some concessions for them. Import tax on EVs was sl slashed from 100% to 15%. And Tesla pounced on the opportunity. Its founder, Elon Musk, has planned a trip to India. He has an appointment with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. This meeting could take place later this month. And they could formally announce Tesla's foray into India. In fact, Tesla executives are already scouting for showroom spaces in Delhi and Mumbai, according to reports. All of this seems to have upset the Global Times. Well, they don't manufacture cars. They make propaganda, so that's what they're doing now. Throwing all kinds of dirt at this project. 
Their video has some unsolicited advice slash warnings for Tesla. It says Tesla won't be able to make cars, quote unquote, efficiently and effectively in India. Plus, India has no supply chains for EVs. There is poor infrastructure, there is corruption, bureaucracy is a problem, the business environment is negative, and so on and so forth. And to underscore these points further, the video features images of chaotic Indian streets, poor roads, and underdeveloped rural areas. So the intention here is quite clear. Portray India as too backward for Tesla's advanced EVs. The Global Times says India is, and I'm quoting, immature and underdeveloped for Tesla and its EVs. In the same breath, they also claim that Tesla would be better served in China. In fact, I have some more quotes for you. So Elon Musk, we have to say very good luck to you. If you attempt to do this in India, I think you're going to need it. China has better infrastructure, China has better supply chains, so China has already, China already has an extensive spread of charging stations. It goes on and on. A long rant making a short point. China is better, make Teslas here. Why doesn't the Global Times give this advice to Chinese companies, the ones who want to make their cars in India? Like BYD, a Chinese EV maker, the world's biggest seller of EVs, BYD is launching its cars in India. They entered India two years back. They already have 24 dealerships in India and they hope to capture 90% of India's EV market. The Global Times should school them first on India's roads and supply chains. Because BYD wants to compete in the same space as Tesla, the high-end premium segment. If India is such a hopeless market, how is BYD expanding at such a rapid pace here? But then again, we're talking about the Global Times. Perhaps they don't understand fact-checking. Tesla's India project is a business decision. It is not a geopolitical move. Tesla sales are down across the world. It faces stiff competition from Chinese players. Just today, Tesla sagged 10% of its workforce. So they're cutting costs. They want to sell more cars. And for that, they will have to enter new markets like India, where there is still room for growth. Tesla cannot rely on China, where EV sales are declining. In January this year, sales were down by 39%, and this trend is expected to continue. Plus, the Chinese economy is in a bad shape, so the big picture there looks gloomy. India offers a sharp contrast with opportunities for growth. The Global Times needs to be in tune with the times. And finally, our favorite subject. Do you have a case of the Monday blues? If yes, this story is for you. A retail tycoon has introduced something called sad leave. In other words, a mental health leave where employees can take a day off when their mental health is in a poor state. According to the firm, the goal is to help employees achieve a better work-life balance. Over the past few years, mental health leave has become a growing global phenomenon across companies, colleges, even schools. The question is, does it really help? Here's a report. Are you unhappy at work? We don't mean to nudge you towards an existential crisis, but if you don't work in the imaginary land of unicorns and rainbows, there is a very real possibility that you're not thrilled about work. We aren't saying this, data is. Workers are unhappier now than they were at the height of the pandemic. According to surveys, 22% workers are sad in the US and 50% are stressed at their jobs on a daily basis. In India, about 60% workers are unhappy at work. And in China, 65% of employees feel tired and unhappy at work. But a Chinese retail tycoon wants to change this. It has introduced sad leave days, where employees can take a day off when they feel off. Basically, they can apply for a leave of absence when their mental health is in poor shape. This doesn't mean you take leave 365 days of the year, citing perennial sadness. In that case, a therapy session may be ideal. Workers are entitled to 10 days of sad leave per year. And as per the rules, this leave cannot be denied by managers. So what is the goal here? To help employees achieve a better work-life balance, to make sure they prioritize their well-being. And why would an employee want to take a sad leave? The reasons can be multifold, like stress and burnout, trouble at home, or maybe you simply need a day off from work to evaluate why you are still working there. Either way, the supermarket chain is not alone. Over the past few years, firms, schools and colleges have offered mental health leave across the world. 
Last month, Taiwanese high schools joined the club. They are offering up to three days off each semester to address rising rates of youth suicide in the nation. The question is, are people willing to take mental health sick days? According to reports, many are. Last year, British civil servants took a record 771,433 days of sick leave because of stress and other mental health problems. This was a 38% jump from the year before. And those who can't take leave are stepping away from work. They're putting their mental well-being first. We saw this with teachers and healthcare workers who left their positions in droves after the pandemic. We are seeing this with athletes as well, the likes of Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles. Deciding to take time off work is really easy and taking a leave for mental health reasons is even harder, especially because this privilege is not afforded to everyone. Some people can't skip work and others may face prejudice. But did you know that one in four of us experiences a mental health problem every year, according to research? Ignoring the highs and lows and going about business as usual is not just bad for workers, it's bad for companies and countries, because mental health affects productivity at work. According to the World Health Organization, the global economy loses $1 trillion each year from reduced productivity. Taking a mental health leave may sound daunting, but it offers an opportunity to refresh your mind. It helps you take a break from the daily stress. And sure, it's only a temporary fix. It's not meant to address deeper problems. But if you find yourself deciding whether to drive to work or leave the country to start a new life, just take a mental health day. Now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Georgia, lawmakers brawl inside the parliament over a controversial bill. North Korea marks the 112th birth anniversary of the state's founder, Kim Il-sung. In California, stranded sea otter pups are paired with surrogate moms. And finally, taking you back in history on this day in 1912, the Titanic sank into the depths of the North Atlantic Ocean. After it struck an iceberg, more than 1,500 lost their lives. At the time, the supposedly unsinkable vessel was the largest and most luxurious ship in the world. And after 112 years, it continues to captivate people's imagination. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank mm -hmm. you.